Anything we can do to achieve that goal, we will. We are particularly interested in driving capacity into the profession through the provision of the support to Australian educators to foster domestic talent of Australian and ensuring the future pipeline of talent supports the growth aspirations of the ICT sector. In order to do this, ACS's commitment to technology talent extends to providing thought leadership, mentoring and support to our educators and teachers in order to improve the learning outcomes of students who will become the future ICT professionals. This will, include providing a professional, this will include providing professional advice and support to assist K-12 education, sorry, educator implements um, the digital technologies curriculum in Australia. Professional support extends to tonight's keynote speaker, Professor Mitch Resnick. During the keynote presentations, I'd encourage you to post your questions via the hashtag and the hashtags on the bottom of the, um, the slides. At the conclusion of tonight's keynote, There'll be uh, time for some questions, followed by drinks. I would encourage you to stay back and have a drink or two and get to uh, network with people. From prestigious Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, in America, Professor Resnick is an outstanding professional in childhood education, a world leader in developing 21st century skills in primary and secondary school students. You may know his work through Scratch, the programming language used to teach students code worldwide and nearly every Australian school. Author of Lifelong Kindergarten, cultivating creativity through projects, passion, passions, peers and play, Mitch is the Lego Papert Professor of Learning Research, Director of the Okawa Centre and Director of the Lifelong Kindergarten Group at MIT Lab. Mitch undertook his PhD under the supervision of the late Professor Seymour Papert, one of the most celebrated thought leaders in education in recent times. Please join me in welcoming Mitch Resnick. Well, it's great to be here. I uh, just arrived in Australia yesterday and I'm looking forward to spending the next week here. Uh, I've been in Australia. <laughs> I've been in Australia a couple times before. Actually, the first time in the early 90s with Seymour Papert, who is my, my mentor and a great inspiration. So it's nice returning from them. I was here again 10 years ago, and it's nice to come back and to share some thoughts with you. I really want to you know, also extend my appreciation to ACS and Lego Education uh, for hosting my visit here. And it's great to get a chance to share some of my ideas and also to hear more about uh, the, what's happening with education and learning here in Australia. I called my talk tonight, Cultivating Creativity Through Projects, Passion, Peers, and Play. And I want to emphasize that word, creativity. Because I feel that there's nothing more important in today's world than helping young people grow up as creative thinkers. I think there's one thing we can all agree upon, and that's that you know, today's world is changing so rapidly. Uh, and that today's young people will face a never-ending stream of unknown and uncertain and unpredictable situations in their life. So to thrive in this rapidly changing world, the ability to think and act creatively is more important than ever before. But unfortunately, most schools in most parts of the world weren't designed to support kids developing as creative thinkers. So I want to talk tonight about you know, how it is that we can support children growing up to develop their creative capacities so they'll be prepared to thrive in today's rapidly changing world. Let me start with a story about one particular young person who is using our Scratch software and to talk about her trajectory and her development as a creative thinker. So she's a member of the Scratch community. When you join the Scratch online community, you choose a username. Her username is Ipsy. This is a a picture that she drew of herself. And Ipsy loved to draw. As she was growing up, she'd come home from school every day and fill notebooks with sketches and drawings. And actually, she'd never done so much with computers and hadn't expressed so much interest. But at one point, one of her friends told her about Scratch and said that if she used Scratch, she could make her drawings come alive. So that intrigued Ipsy about making her drawings come alive. So she joined Scratch. And I'm going to show you, this is one of the first projects that Ipsy did in Scratch. So if you look closely, 
you can see it's one of her drawings. It just add a little bit of animation if you notice how the eyes are moving and the ears are moving. And I almost see Ipsy like testing the water. She's done with something she's comfortable with and dipping her toe in the water of programming. You can see on the right hand side there, those are the graphical blocks she put together in order to create the animation. In Scratch, she snapped together graphical programming blocks, some like Lego bricks, in order to control the different behaviors of different characters in your stories and games. So Ipsy created this, and she really liked the idea that she was able to do a new type of expression, a new type of creation with her drawings. So she continued to come back to Scratch and to experiment with different ways that she could animate and create different you know, moving, moving drawings. A few weeks later, she progressed and did the following project that was called Lemonade Time. And with Lemonade Time, it was a project that was a game that you can play that when you play Lemonade Time, if you hit the arrow keys, you can move the otter back and forth, and you can get clues about how to gather the ingredients for making lemonade. So she programmed each of these different characters. You move so that a user of the game could move the otter, go around and get tips from the frog and the bird about where to get the lemons and the water and the sugar in order to make lemonade. So this is just a, a video capture of someone playing the game that she had created. So she put this on the Scratch website. Because on Scratch, in addition to being a programming language, it's an online community. So when you create a project like this one, you can share it in the online community, and other people can play your project. So Ipsy put this up there, and this project got her quite well known in the community. This is the project page where you can see her project. If you look, you can see that 17,000 people viewed and interacted with her project. Almost 2,000 people said they loved her project. There is 88 people remix the project. When you remix a project, it means you take someone's project and you make some changes to it. You can change the images or change the code in order to make your own version of it. And this is pretty common in Scratch. We designed the website so you can build on each other's work because uh, we know that everyone's going to benefit if you build on each other's work. So 88 people remixed her project. 1800 pe there were 1,800 comments on the project that other people in the community are giving her feedback and advice and encouragement. Now, some of them were just sort of simple you know, you know, comments like, awesome, that's great. Other people made specific suggestions. And you can tell that Ipsy was paying attention to the suggestions, because if you look at the instructions, it says, edit, due to popular demand, the otter walks a little faster now. <laughs> so clearly, she was listening to the comments, and like any good designer, was modifying her creation based on what others were saying. A lot of the comments on the project were saying how much they liked her artwork. And people were saying, we'd love to see more of your artwork. Can you show us more? And actually, some people said, we'd like to use your artwork. Could you share some of your artwork so we can use it in our projects? Again, remixing it to their projects. So Ipsy put up the following project, which was a gallery of her artwork. She even branded it, Ipsy Studio. As you go through it, you then you can, the user can go through and you know, click to see different of the characters that Ipsy created. And then also, they could grab it and use it in their own projects. And if you look at the instructions, Ipsy says you can edit these as much as you want, but you must credit me if you use any of these scripts, if you, any of these sprites. The characters in Scratch are called sprites. So you have to credit me if you use any of these characters. So here you can see Ipsy becoming a good member of the Scratch community, of being generous and sharing her things, but also recognizing that people should give credit if they're going to make use of it. And this is something that sometimes is difficult for kids to learn as they join the Scratch community. In fact, later on when we you know, interviewed Ipsy, she was explaining that at first she was really upset when people started using her artwork. She said, they're stealing my artwork. Because she was so proud of her artwork, she didn't want people to use it. But then she talked to others in the community, and she realized that there was a benefit for everybody sharing, that because she could also learn from other people's artwork and, 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 and do that. And also, she developed a pride in seeing other people make use of what she had done. And she really realized that everyone benefits when everyone shares. So she really became a good member. It was, we see this as part of digital citizenship, of learning how to share, but also give credit as credit is appropriate. In addition to sharing her artwork, Ipsy also starts sharing some of the programming skills that she picked up. 
because even though she had never done any programming before starting on scratch, she became a pretty sophisticated programmer. Like in that Lemonade Time project, you might notice the background was scrolling, like it does in a lot of video games. So as the character moved, the background would scroll. Now, actually, that's not so easy to do in Scratch. In fact, we've, we've been trying to make it easier to do, but we haven't come up with a good way. But Ipsy and others have figured out how to do scrolling backgrounds. So other people started asking, how did you make the scrolling background? So Ipsy made a tutorial about a basic scrolling game tutorial that explains how she made scrolling backgrounds, shows an example of it, starts showing some of the sample code that she used in order to do it. There's some of the sample code about how to make these type of scrolling backgrounds. Now, when we developed Scratch, we assumed that we would put some tutorials up online, and we assumed some teachers would put up tutorials online. We never imagined so many kids like Ipsy would put tutorials. But if you look on the website, there are literally thousands and thousands of tutorials made by kids sharing what they've learned in Scratch, because kids really want to share what they've learned with others. So there's everything from how to do certain types of drawings, how to make scrolling backgrounds, how to use variables in Scratch, even tutorials on how to make your projects popular on Scratch. So you can see here, Ipsy, even as she's commenting her code, but comments on the code like a good programmer uh, in order to help other people know how to use the things more effectively. So I think you, know, you can see, you know, as Ipsy was working on this, I think there are a lot of things that Ipsy was learning as she was, as she was working on these projects in Scratch. I mean, the one thing that might be most obvious as she was developing the, the programs and learning programming skills, she was certainly learning to reason systematically. And that's one of the reasons that a lot of people are interested in helping kids learn to code these days. Certainly there's a type of systematic reasoning that goes into it, a logical thinking that you need in order to put together these projects. And Ipsy was certainly learning that. But at the same time, she was certainly learning to work collaboratively. Since Scratch is embedded in this online community, that Ipsy was learning how to work together with others, how to provide different types of tutorials for others, how to get feedback from others and integrate it into her projects. At the same time, and in my mind, maybe most importantly, she was learning how to think creatively, how to, start to come up with new ideas. If you just look at that range of projects I showed, and those are only a handful of the dozens of projects that Ipsy has created and has shared, you can see the range and diversity and creativity of the project that Ipsy was creating. As I said at the beginning, I feel that there's nothing more important in today's world than to develop those types of creative capacities, you know, to be able to come up with innovative solutions to new situations as they arise. And we see Ipsy and many other kids on Scratch being able to you know, develop those types of you know, creative capacities as they work on their Scratch projects. Now, will Ipsy grow up to become a professional programmer, computer scientist? If I had to bet, my guess is probably not. But that wasn't our main goal. So of course, there are great opportunities and, you know, it, it, for programming positions in the future, and there are great job opportunities. But our main goal is not to help prepare the programmers, the professional programmers of the future. We want everybody to be able to use the computer as a way of expressing themselves. And we feel these qualities and the skills of reasoning systematically, working collaboratively, and thinking creatively are important for everybody in today's society. Uh, so it's not just for people who are gonna grow up with specific programming or computer science jobs, but doing these types of projects that kids do in Scratch helps prepare everyone, whether she grows up to be a journalist or a marketing manager or an engineer or a doctor or a, a, whatever she ends up doing, these skills will be something that she really can put to play. So in developing Scratch, we're always thinking about how is it that we can support the development of these types of skills, how to help people learn to think creatively and really be prepared for today's society. As we've done that, we've come up with, I tend to come up to describe four guiding principles that can support the development of creative thinking. So as we develop technologies and activities like Scratch, we're always thinking about these four guiding principles of projects, passion, peers, and play. And we think that you know, the best way to help kids develop as creative thinkers is to provide them with opportunities to work on projects based on their passions, in collaboration with peers, in a playful spirit. Let me just say a few words about each of those. You know, if we think about projects, it might seem obvious, clearly Ipsy was working on projects, but actually, that's not the way that most kids are being taught to code these days. 
oftentimes, in the way coding is often introduced in schools, is kids are given a specific problem or puzzle to solve, they solve it, they move on to the next one, solve another one, move on to the next one, and they learn some basic technical skills and concepts that way. But we feel it's better to introduce coding in terms of projects, the way the IPSI was doing, where, where kids start with an idea, create something, experiment with it, share with others, keep modifying and adapting it based on their experiences with it. That's what it's like to work on a project. And we think that by working on projects is where kids are really developing that creative thinking skills about how to you know, figure out when things go wrong, how to debug things to fix it when it goes, when it goes wrong, how to share with others. So we think that this project-based approach is the best way for kids to develop the creative thinking skills, not just learning the technical skills. With passion, we find that over and over that kids and adults too are willing to work longer and harder when they work on things they're passionate about, things they're interested in. And also when kids work on things they're passionate about, they make deeper connections with the ideas that they're working on. The things become more meaningful and more memorable when you work on things you really care about. So with Scratch, we want to make sure that kids are always working on things that are growing out of their own interests. We saw that with Ipsy, she loves drawing. So she was able to use her love of drawing as a pathway into programming. So she loved what she was doing in Scratch because it was building on something she already loved. It was building on her passion. And we wanted to make sure that all kids could build on their passions. Some love drawing, some love music, some whatever, whatever kids are interested in, we want them to be able to use Scratch to build on those interests because you know that's the way they're going to make the deepest connection to the ideas and have the, you know, the, the persistence to keep working on things. Because again, it's hard work to work on these types of things, but you're only willing to put in the hard work when you're you know, doing something you really care about. And then peers, you know, we, wanted, we know that creative learning is a social process. It's not something you just do by yourself. The most creative things we do come in collaboration with others. I think sometimes people get the wrong idea when they think about the great Rodin sculpture, The Thinker. <laughs> and you know, The Thinker is a single person sitting in contemplation. And of course, sometimes it's useful to sit by yourself in contemplation. But that's not the way the most creative work happens. So with Scratch, we want to make sure to support kids working with peers, but then learning with and from others. And that's why when we launched Scratch 10 years ago, it wasn't just as a programming language, but also as the online community. So kids have access to lots of others, both as a source of inspiration and as an audience. So when kids make something, other, they can put it out in the community to get feedback from others. And if they're looking for new ideas, they can look and see what others have created. They get inspiration from others online. And then the fourth P, play. I sometimes call this the most misunderstood P. Because when people hear play, they sometimes just think about laughter and having fun. And again, there's nothing wrong with laughter and having fun. But I don't think that's the most critical part for creative learning. When I think of play, I don't think of it so much as an activity, but more of an attitude. So when you have a playful approach or a playful attitude, it means you're willing to take risks, to try new things, to test the boundaries. And the most creative work happens when you're willing to experiment and try new things in that way. So we want to make a, a comfortable environment where kids are willing to try things out, take risks, and if something goes wrong, not to see it as a failure, but to see it as an opportunity to learn new things, to make revisions, to do it. So we've tried to create the environment to do that. And you can see it in Ipsy, a playful approach in the work that she was creating. So again, we're always looking to see how we can support projects, passion, peers, and play as a way to help kids develop as creative thinkers. Let me show you, just give you a sense of the way this plays out in a setting, in a classroom or at a workshop. I'm going to show you a video of a workshop that we worked on where kids were using Scratch in connection with, the phys with physical materials. So they were using some of the LEGO robotics kits, the LEGO we do, along with lots of craft materials and then using Scratch to make their physical creations come alive. You know, if we want to help kids develop as creative thinkers, we want to give them the opportunity to create. So we'd love to give them the opportunities to both create in the physical world, but then create programs in order to control the things they create. So take a look at this video. It's a one minute video. And keep in the back of your mind, how is this environment supporting projects, passion, peers, and play as kids are building in the physical world and controlling it with Scratch? The goal of these creative workshops is really to give children an opportunity to come up with their own ideas, imagine something, and then figure out how to design it. We should 
still keep this plate, but take this one. They need to be constantly exploring, experimenting. It works! Whoa. Oh my god. Through yeah. natural discovery, by testing things, by tinkering, by experimenting, by creating. They're using Lego motors and sensors, and then if it doesn't work the way they want, they start revising it. So you have to kind of adjust the motor power so they, it actually has enough power to knock the lights off. So they're really learning through having a goal, having imagining something, and then bringing it to life. So rather than just thinking of the computer of something that I think, what am I supposed to do? They start thinking, what do I want to do with it? They start getting new ideas. I think even in that short video, you can start to get a sense of how the creativity is unleashed if you give kids the right opportunities to both, you know, be building and creating the physical world and controlling it. I think you can see also why there's this natural connection, why we've had such a, our group has had such this great collaboration with the Lego company for years, is because we want to engage kids in building in all sorts of ways, building in the virtual world, building in the physical world. And they're both activities are based on this playful approach to creating. As it says in the video, tinkering, experimenting, give kids the chance to continue to design things, iterate on those designs, adapt, refine over time. And that's exactly what we want to help kids do. Uh, oftentimes, actually we call my research group the lifelong kindergarten group, because we're inspired by the way kids learn in kindergarten. In kindergarten, kids do get lots of opportunities to playfully create things in collaboration with one another, building towers with blocks, making pictures with finger paints and crayons, and in the process, they develop their creative skills. Too often after kindergarten, kids you know, go, on to, go on to school and they spend too much time filling out worksheets, listening to lectures. And of course, they learn some things that way, but they really aren't developing as creative thinkers. Um, and in fact, even these days, you go into some kindergartens, and in kindergartens, you see kids filling out phonics worksheets and drilling on math flashcards. Too many kindergartens are becoming more like the rest of school. What we want to do is exactly the reverse. We want to make the rest of school, in fact, the rest of life, more like kindergarten. So like in that video, you can see these certainly are older than kindergarten. These kids, I think, were like 10 to 13 years old. But it had a kindergarten spirit that they were constantly experimenting, exploring, work on projects, passion, peers, and play in order to develop as creative thinkers. We even take this very seriously in the place where I work at the MIT Media Lab. It's one of the world's great research lab and known for its technological innovation. But the reason it's so successful, I think, at the Media Lab is because we run the Media Lab like a big kindergarten. The graduate students, the researchers at the Media Lab are constantly playfully creating things in collaboration with one another. They work on projects based on their passions in collaboration with peers in a playful spirit. That's make the Media Lab such a creative place. Uh, so it can work in kindergarten, it can work at the Media Lab, we just have to change everything else and to see how we can make sure that everybody has these same opportunities. Again, that was our driving force as we developed Scratch. You know, Scratch was launched a little over 10 years ago. Actually, it was, I came to Australia last time shortly after Scratch was launched. It was part of you know, launching Scratch. It was also right when the We Do uh, Robotics Kit that was featured in the video was launched. Uh, but Scratch has grown a lot in those last 10 years. So you can just see the growth in the last few years. This is the number of kids joining as official members of the online community. Last year, there was 8 million kids joined in the online community. There's a total of more than 30 million kids in the community now. Every day, kids in the community share more than 30,000 new projects. So there's this ongoing stream of new projects that can serve as inspiration for others. But in fact, what's most exciting for me is not the number of new projects, but the diversity of new projects. If you look at the Scratch online community, you'll see everything from animated stories to interactive birthday cards to anime comic strips to virtual construction kits. This is a virtual Lego construction kit made by a teenager in Belgium. Recreations of classic video games, dress-up doll games, tutorials, interactive artwork, science simulations. Now, this diversity of projects is what's most meaningful to us, but to us it serves as an, an indicator that kids are expressing themselves creatively. If we just went to the Scratch website and we saw all the projects look pretty similar, well, kids might be learning some technical skills, but it would show they really aren't developing as creative thinkers. So whenever we run a workshop or look at the Scratch website, one of our indicators of success is how much diversity is there. Because we know 
the kids have tremendous diversity in their backgrounds, their interests, their learning styles. So they're going to express themselves in many different ways. So if we really are meet, re meeting the needs of a wide range of kids, and we really do want to reach all kids from all backgrounds with all different interests. So to do that, we need to make sure that we can create an environment that kids are going to do it all different types of projects. Um, now, when we started Scratch 10 years ago, a lot of the initial use of Scratch was in homes. And kids would use Scratch at home and then in community centers. Uh, in fact, the initial idea for Scratch came from our work in a network of after-school centers that we started called computer clubhouses for kids from low-income communities where they'd come in and learn to use technology in creative ways. So Scratch got started in homes and community centers, then museums and libraries. But now the fastest growth of Scratch is in schools. And I know that Scratch is used in a lot of schools here in Australia. And I think we are hoping that as Scratch goes more and more into schools, that it keeps that same spirit, that it, that it gets brought into schools not just for learning specific technical skills of coding, but to help kids develop as creative thinkers and to learn to work collaboratively in addition to reasoning systematically. So I'll show a couple examples of some of the projects. As I look around schools, the types that you know, sort of connect with some of the things that I'm hoping to see as Scratch goes into schools. This first project I'm going to show it came, came from India. It was from a school in Bangalore. Uh, and the teacher from the school, when I met you know, the teacher, shared this project that one of the students had made. This was from a science classroom. And in this science classroom, they were studying the layers of the Earth. And as they did this, this unit on the layers of the Earth, uh, instead of having the students do a final report, the teacher asked them to do a scratch project. And here was one of the projects from the class. So the first thing that I like about this is you can see he's personalizing, he's bringing his own voice in, he's speaking in his native language of Kannada. And he's explaining, he's giving us a guided tour of the earth. So he's sharing what he had learned, so it's a way for him to show what he had learned and also to help other people learn about it. And evidently, you know, the teacher explained to me that this student was really surprised to learn that things are moving inside the Earth. He said, the Earth is solid. I didn't know things were moving inside. So he wants to show that things are moving inside the Earth and tell other people things are moving inside the Earth. I like this, the sound effects of the water table when he gets there. He added his own sound effects. So again, for me, this is a good example of where a project can help kids cut across the disciplinary boundaries. Certainly, he's learning some coding skills but also reinforcing the science knowledge that he had learned, learned to communicate in new ways. And that's the way we hope that Scratch will become a type of new form of expression for kids to share with one another. Uh, we see another example of that. The next example is from an elementary school in the United States where they were reading the children's book, Charlotte's Web. I don't know if that's popular here in Australia, but I know I read it when I was growing up. So I think this was a third or fourth grade classroom where they were reading Charlotte's Web and then the kids, for their book reports, they used Scratch to create animated book reports. So this was a book report from one of the kids in the classroom. And some of the things I liked about this, so certainly it was a language you know, part of the curriculum where they're reading the book. And certainly you can see that there were, you know, the, the, the girl who wrote this was writing about what she learned in the book. So she was developing language skills. But also notice, notice how the pig, as it's moving forward and back, it gets bigger when it's close to us and smaller when it's further away. So here, and you can see it again here, it's clear the student was learning, was using something they had learned in art class about perspective. If you want to make something look further away, make it smaller. How did they make the pig smaller? Well, in Scratch, there's a command that lets you set the size of a character or a sprite. So in order to make it smaller and smaller and smaller, if you look at the code, what the student did was, multiplied the size by a fraction less than one. So they had learned that mathematical idea that if you multiply by a fraction less than one, you get a smaller number, and then use that to make the size of the pig get smaller and smaller. Now again, in most classrooms where kids are learning about multiplying fractions, they have no idea why they're learning it. They're learning it to try to, you know, to do well on the test at the end of the, of the year, but they have no idea how this could actually be useful. When she was using it in Scratch, she had a real purpose for using it. I think that's what we want to have kids do. We want them to learn things that they can put to use, where they can use it in a meaningful way. Uh, again, my mentor, Seymour Papert, would sometimes complain that schools too often 
would insist that kids had to learn the basics first and then put them to use. And he said, that's a mistake, and I agree with him. Instead of learning the basics before working on a project, you should learn them through working on a project. Because if you learn those ideas, it is important, there's certain things we do want kids to learn, but if they learn it through work on a project, they're gonna make deeper connection to those ideas. They'll become more motivating and more meaningful and more memorable. So we're always trying to see how with Scratch we can provide opportunities for kids to learn things in a meaningful context. And to give kids an opportunity to, as they do this, to develop their own way of expressing themselves. We really take seriously the analogy between coding and writing. But you know, we all agree that kids learn to write is very important. But we don't have kids learn to write because we expect all of them to grow up to become professional writers. Of course, a few will become professional journalists or novelists. A few will use their writing as the, the core of their profession. But not most people. But writing is still important. First of all, as practical use, you write, in, write your shopping list. But also as a way of expressing your ideas. When you learn to write, you learn how to organize and express and share your ideas. And that's important for everyone. And we see coding the same way. As these kids are creating these projects, they're learning to organize and express and share their ideas, just as you do when you learn to write. There, you can almost see coding in this way as an extended form of writing. You're just writing a different type of thing. Instead of just writing with words, you're writing something that's dynamic and interactive. So it's just a new way for kids to create and share their creations. Again, some of them will use it in a professional way. Others will use it, as you saw, interactive birthday cards you see on Scratch, the same way that kids you know, over the years have always you know, written a, a card to a friend. Now they can make an interactive card for a friend, a new way to express you know, you know, how they feel about someone else. Um, so we see coding in this way that everyone can use it as a new form of expression. So it's not just about kids developing their thinking, but also developing their voice, a new way for them to express themselves. And I think also developing their identity. We want kids to see themselves as being in control of the new technology. We want them to feel that I'm the type of person who can create with new technology. And I think to feel that you're a full and active participant in today's society, you shouldn't just feel that you can interact with technology, but you should feel I can create with that. So we see kids you know, not just learning the skills, but getting a sense of that, you know, that this is something they can control, that they can create with, that they can become a full and active contributor with these new, new technologies. Now, we continue to see how we can continue to do this to stretch Scratch in new directions, to open up these possibilities for more and more kids to do more and more things. You know, a few years ago, we launched a version of Scratch called Scratch Junior for younger kids. You notice the blocks here don't have words on them, but rather icons. It's just a more limited set of things. This is aimed for ages five to seven. Scratch we designed for ages eight and up. But we've seen the core idea is the same. Enable kids from an early age to start expressing themselves with the computer. This is a type of storytelling tool. And again, kids in, you know, even pre-kindergarten, they start to tell stories. They learn to develop their creativity through their storytelling skills. This gives them a new way to tell stories. It's not replacing the way they tell stories by you know, doing things with finger paint or telling stories to friends. But this is another way. We want kids to have many different avenues for being able to share their stories and share their ideas with one another. To continue, of course, Technologies continue to change and the world keeps changing. We have to keep evolving with Scratch. So in fact, right now we're working on the next generation of Scratch. The first generation came out 10 years ago. We had another generation around five years ago that brought Scratch and embedded it in the browser so you could do everything online. The first version you had to download and use locally. So it made it more seamless to both create and share when it became online. But we're now working on the third generation. There's a prototype out now. It's going to be launched fully uh, in January, just a few months from now. So we still have a lot, of very busy few months ahead of us. So actually, like two months from now, we'll be launching it. Let me get, I'll show you a brief video that shows some of the new features we're working on for this new version of Scratch. Again, 
you know, if we want kids to create, we, we're always trying to think, how can we give them more ways to create and more ways to get started creating? Um, so one of the things that's at the core of this new generation of Scratch is it's designed in more modular ways, so it's easy to keep on adding new components that we'll keep adding and others around the world will keep extending it. Uh, so these are some of the, what we call extensions. Each of these extensions adds a new collection of blocks that kids can use. So you can see there'll be extensions for LEGO Robotics kits, like LEGO Mindstorms and LEGO We Do. There'll also be some software extensions for like doing text-to-speech. So if you, text, if you type in text, that your characters can actually then talk. Let me just like, show an example. Here's some of the new blocks we're working on. So you can have a speak block. Do you type in any word, and your character will actually be able to talk. There's also a speech recognition system we're working on. Again, these are building on you know, there's all these new AI capabilities that are available in different web services. We don't want kids just being, you know, sort of, at, you, know, you know, interacting with these things. We want them to, we want them to be at the control of the kids, for kids to be able to create things using these new capabilities of computers. So kids should be able to use speech recognition. You put in a block that says something like, when I hear something, it then triggers an action. So they could build projects with voice commands that respond to voice commands. Kids are growing up in a world where lots of different devices respond to voice. Well, kids should be able to create things like that as well. So like here's an example. This is a project. And it says here, it says, when I hear what time is it, it then says it's party time, and then makes a little animation. So if I say, what time is it? Party time. <laughs> So again, trying to make sure that kids have the opportunity to create these things, not just interact with them. Also, many more ways of interacting with the world. I'll show a live demo here. Uh, this first one, actually the picture there. Oops, make sure I get that out of the way. So this is, new, this is a prototype of a device that we're working on that actually we've been calling the Scratch Bit, but the name might change. So it's a little sensor device that can communicate with the computer so you can sort of get sensory inputs out in the world and then communicate to the computer. So in this case, someone made a Scratch game that's about a flying bicycle. And then they used Lego materials to make bicycle handlebars. So they're making their own customized controller. And then they inserted the Scratch Bit so it can tell when it's tilted and it had a new set of commands you can control the game by the way I, the, you, you move this around. So the same way you start Scratch projects with the green flag that you click, here there's a green button, so I can click to start the project. And I control the bicycle to get the balloons. Here. So again, if I hit the button, there's a bike horn. Hey. And again, so many kids' games these days, they always control things remotely, but someone else is doing the creating. They're just doing the playing. We want kids to do the creating, and both types of creating, both creating the game, then creating their own controllers for controlling the game. And you can see we just have you know, a few new, these are the new commands that came with it. So like it says, when button is pressed, play the bike horn. <laughs> and then it says, point that the bike should, in the, in the graphic should point in the direction of how this is tilted. So, and then it moves left and right, changes the X position, the left, right, based on how much this is tilted. I'll show one more example. This is using another device, the micro bit, which I know a bunch of people here are using. So it's a low-cost controller device. And in this case, it's a, a story that was created. And there's a frog that says, help change me back to a wizard by casting a spell. And kids created a magic wand. And if I cast a spell by shaking the magic wand, I say, abracadabra. <coughs> oh, no, it, it didn't get to a wizard. It was an octopus. Let me try again. Abracadabra. A parrot. <coughs> a watermelon. Let me try one last time. So turn into a wizard. Abracadabra. <coughs> there it goes. So again, there's new commands there to here that you know, say, say, 
when the microbit is shaken. So you can do different things. You can say when it's shaken, do one thing. If, it's, if you jump up and down, make it do another thing. So like just to show you, if I say, when, the, when I jump with it, this is for the wizard, I'm going to make the wizard get bigger every time I jump. So if I say, whenever the micro bit jumps, then it should change the size by 10. So now every time I jump, the wizard's getting bigger and bigger. It's like, oh, no, it's also shaking. <laughs> Was it getting bigger? I think it is. OK, there it is. Uh, so again, you can make different ways of interacting with things on the screen. Uh, and again, I think you know, part of this is, again, trying to have this diversity of pathways. As I mentioned, we want to make sure that all kids have ways of getting engaged. Uh, again, my, again you know, Seymour Papperter talked about the importance of a low floor and a high ceiling. It's important to have easy ways of getting started, a low floor, and you should be able to do more and more complex things over time, a high ceiling. But we, now we also talk about wide walls, meaning it's important for kids to have many different pathways to go from the low floor to the ceiling. Again, different kids have different interests, so it's important to have many different ways for them to get engaged with these materials. So with all the things we keep adding, is to make sure that we keep widening those walls to make sure that all kids from all backgrounds, all learning styles, have ways of getting engaged and continue to express themselves you know, with this technology. <coughs> But of course, as we add new technology, the key thing is to never lose sight of these four Ps. That I think that you know, our ultimate goal is not about technology, it's about learning. And how is it that we can help kids grow up so they can continue to express themselves creatively, learn to think more creatively. So as we develop the new technologies, you know, with, whether it's new hardware, new online AI systems, it's always focused on helping kids develop their creative capacities by giving them opportunities to work on projects based on their passions, collaboration with peers, and a playful spirit. And let me end with one of my favorite Scratch projects from the last few years that I think captures some of the spirit of what we've been hoping for as we, as we created Scratch. This is a project, and we didn't know this Scratcher, uh, but he created this project, uh, and uh, when I first saw this online, it really struck me how it was capturing some of the spirit of making sure that we're connecting with everybody from all different backgrounds. Hi, my name is Alex, and this is my story. Some of my favorite hobbies are playing video games and drawing. I've been creating comics for a very long time. I'm very good at math and coding. I'm very funny, kind, and smart. I also have autism. Autism affects me in many ways. It makes me think different. Sometimes in math I would solve problems in ways that even my teachers didn't think of. You think they know it, but no! Sometimes when I need to think, I pace. It helps me concentrate and it's called stimming. My teachers let me do this because it helps me think. Autism makes me a very picky eater. I like crunchy foods and I don't like mushy foods because they make me gag. The texture of the food bothers my senses. My senses are supercharged and sometimes that makes me feel uncomfortable. Sometimes I get really overwhelmed by bad feelings and I just want people to be understanding and patient. It's okay to be different. However, some people don't treat different people very nicely. And there is just so much no with that decision. I wish people would treat different people completely normally. Being different makes the world more diverse. If everyone was the same, then the world would not be very interesting. I think that the secret to a good life is to just you be you. Pick your path and accept others for which path they choose. Be kind. That is my story. So, yeah. And I do think you know, what we wanted was we want kids to you be you. So it made us so happy that he was developing his voice, but also encouraging other kids to develop their voice and for them to be able to express their you know, individuality as well. 
So we're just so excited to see kids around the world be able to do it. So we feel so fortunate that we get to see what kids around the world are doing. And we're so committed to trying to make sure that all kids around the world have these types of opportunities. So it's great to be here in Australia to be able to work with you because trying to bring about these types of changes to open up these opportunities you know, for kids around the world to have the chance to work on projects, passion, peers, and play uh, is going to take a lot of hard work. It's not going to happen you know, on its own. It's going to take concerted effort. It's something that we're committed to. I've committed my life to it. But we need a movement around the world. You know, hopefully, it's something we can work on together to try to you know, bring about these types of changes to give all kids the opportunity to design, create, experiment, and explore with new technologies so they can be full and active contributors to tomorrow's society. Thanks very much. I'm sure everyone here in the room would love to thank Mitch for his terrific um, speech, sorry, um, with regards to tonight talking about creativity and also empowering learning. So can I please ask everyone to uh, give Mitch a Can I ask if we can make one suggestion? Certainly. Let's take like two or three minutes just to talk to your neighbors and reflect upon some of the things that c came to your mind as you're listening to this or issues that have come up in your own practice about you know, the challenges and opportunities for this type of approach to learning. So maybe, and then think of questions you want to ask. So take two or three minutes and then we'll go to Q&A. Yeah. Yeah. If you agree that you either lead by example or you don't lead at all, and teachers are leaders, what's your view on how to help teachers act and lead with creativity? Right, well, yeah, so, uh, and they asked for me to repeat to make sure that it gets heard by the, for the live stream um, about you know, what's the, what, the, what role should teachers play as leaders in creativity. I think teachers have to see themselves as continual learners of being willing to learn new things and to be uh, continually experimenting, trying new things. The same way we want kids in Scratch or building with Lego robotics to be experimenting, trying new things, tinkering. We want teachers to be doing the same thing. Uh, the teachers shouldn't feel that they have to go into this, that they're full masters of all of the things, that they should be willing to, as I said, with the playful approach, experiment, try new things, take risks, test the boundaries. Be willing to have things go wrong and then see that as an opportunity to experiment, to show kids about the learning process. You know, if, if the most important thing is for kids to learn to be good learners, then they should be apprenticing to good learners, that they should see their teachers as good learners. And a lot of times, teachers don't let the kids see what good learners they are. If they're not sure about something, they hide it. 
Uh, now, of course, I know it's not easy to be upfront about what you don't know in front of a room of kids, uh, and I know that's challenging, but in fact, I think the kids are gonna learn the most if they see the teacher going through their learning process. Uh, I see kids, especially when it, in our after-school centers, these clubhouses, how much kids get engaged when one of the mentors of the clubhouse says, actually, I've never seen that before. I'm not exactly sure what happened. Let's try to figure it out. And it becomes so authentic then about the kids gathering and trying to figure out together what's going on here. We try to do this when we run workshops for educators and professional development workshops. We always try to make sure that it's not educators just thinking, how am I gonna put this to work in the classroom? Although, of course, that's part of it. We wanna make sure they start by experiencing themselves as learners. So to try it out, whether it's, again, doing things with Scratch or Lego Robotics, let them make something, try it themselves, experience the learning process, and then think about how to you know, put it into use in the classroom. But to see themselves as ongoing learners and experience their own creative, you know, continuing creative work, and then try to use that as a way to then support kids as they're going through the creative process. Thank you. Any other questions? We've got one over there. Hi, uh, so I work in uh, trading education, uh, and one of the problems we sort of uh, see a lot is uh, students coming up against a problem and not really knowing how to solve it, and the teacher also not really knowing how to solve it. Uh, without a structured educational approach, how can you? Solve the bootstrapping problem. Yeah. Well, first of all, even with a structured educational approach, you might not be able to solve that problem. You know, uh, so it's not that it's not that the way that we're you know that, yeah. So it's not that there's a straightforward thing. But first of all, one of the most important things is learn about the problem-solving process. So first, of all, I'll, I'll get back to trying to find ways to solve the problem. But even if you don't solve the problem, experiencing good strategies and work together. And if it doesn't work, then maybe you find an alternative path if you can't find a solution to it. So it shouldn't just be that, you know, find a solution to this at all costs. The thing about the process, thing about alternative things to do is one thing to keep in mind. But then also, if, if the student, the teacher doesn't know how to do it, draw on other resources. Again, we see, again, it's not to say that it's always gonna work, but in the Scratch community, kids go online and they look at how other people have worked on similar projects. Uh, they put, no, they put you know, questions up in the online discussion forums to try to figure it out. Uh, there's a lot of, oftentimes there's a lot of expertise within the school that there might be older students in another class that, you know, that know how to do these things. So it is one thing with coding since a lot of kids, there are some kids who put a lot of effort into it. There's probably some expertise in the school drawn that larger pool of expertise to try to solve things. So I do think there's a lot of different strategies for trying to get beyond that. Uh, actually, my colleague, Karen Brennan, she was a former graduate student in my group and then is now a professor at Harvard Ed School. She and one of her students this past summer did this initiative called Getting Unstuck. And what they did was that for 21 days, they gave a type of you know, thematic area for people to work on. And what part of the discussion was about is how people worked on those projects. They talked about how they, could, how they would get unstuck when they got stuck. Because everyone gets stuck. It doesn't matter how much, exper no matter how much expertise you have, People do get stuck. So kind of with strategies for getting unstuck is part of what the, is one of the important things to be learning. We have a question up the front here. Hey, um, just a quick question. Uh, working across many schools here in Australia, uh, we run into a lot of teachers that have a disassociation between playing and learning. So what would your top three tips would be to kind of change that mindset, mindset that playing is learning? Yeah. And yeah, I do think there's this challenge that a lot of people think about play in a somewhat dismissive way. They'll say, just play. Uh, um, I do think one of the things I try to do is to get people to rethink what's meant by play. As I was talking about earlier, that play is not just a matter of you know, laughing and having fun that play is about experimenting, taking risks, trying new things. So try to reframe the way people think about play. Uh, and talk about the process, because when I think of play, it's very tightly interwoven with what the creative process is about. 
we sometimes have this, you know, this creative learning spiral is a framework that I use in my book, Lifelong Kindergarten, that talks about this process of imagining and then creating things and experimenting and playing with it, sharing with others, reflecting upon what you learn, which leads you to imagine new things. So talking about this learning process where play is an integral part of constantly revising, iterating, refining. So see play as part of this creative process uh, where you are adjusting, refining, adapting over time is the way I try to explain it. Again, it's challenging because play has a certain way it's viewed in the culture. So shifting mindsets isn't, isn't easy. Trying to bring these ideas you know, into schools, into classrooms is challenging. It, I didn't say this directly in my talk, but uh, I'm not trying to say that the things I'm talking about are easy to implement. I certainly don't mean that. It's challenging to implement that, but it's important, so it's worth the challenge. It's a worthy challenge. Uh, and I think there's a couple big obstacles. There's both mindsets and, structure, and, and sort of you know, structures that are in place. So the mindsets that people have, how they think about play, how they think about education. You know, people, if they, if they think of education as delivering information, delivering instruction, it's hard to put these principles into practice. If they think about play in this narrow way, it's hard to put it in practice. So mindsets need to change, the way people think about play and learning. And then sort of the structures of the system of school need to change. If every class period is 50 minutes long, it's hard to do project-based learning. But that's, a, you know, and it's not easy to change that because you know, schools are, if they're structured around 50 minute classes, you can't just say, oh, today I'm gonna go for 90 minutes rather than 50 minutes. It, it doesn't fit within the system. So I'm not saying it's easy to change, but we need to explore ways of making those changes. You know, with this, while I'm talking about these you know, structures, I sometimes see that there's all these barriers. There's the barrier of time, you know, limited time. You know, there are barriers that are put up between disciplines. People erect walls between disciplines, which makes it harder to do projects. People put up barriers between inside of school and outside of school, which makes it harder to involve the community in ways that I think could be useful. They put up structures between age. They don't let older kids help out younger kids with programming, which could be useful. So trying to you know, break down some of those existing structures I think is needed. So changing some of the structures and changing some of the mindsets are both important, but it's a long-term effort in order to do that. So but it's important, so we need to try to do it. I mean, I think we see some signs of change in some places, but you know, although the numbers of you know, use of Scratch is growing ra rapidly, the number of places they're using it in the spirit that I was talking about tonight is not growing as rapidly. So we can see some good examples. And there, I can point to you know, good examples out there, but there's a lot of work to be done to make it spread. To, it's easier to spread the technology to, to spread uh, the approach the educational approach. Um, so actually, Seymour Papert used, the, there's a mouthful of a, of a phrase, he used the phrase epistemological dilution. And what he meant by that is, as ideas spread through the world, they get, they get diluted. And it's not easy that you have sort of a core set of ideas and a way of thinking that are associated with Scratch or with Seymour, with Logo. Uh, that way of thinking gets diluted as it gets out to the world. And one of the things we need to do is how we can try to uh, 
try to resist that dilution or to support more people so that the ideas get out there in a strong form. Some of the type of ways that we try to do that, we now, like we have an online course that we offer called Learning Creative Learning. Uh, so it's about learning about creative learning. And it plays out a lot of the ideas that are in my book, Lifelong Kindergarten, but also has activities and discussion forums because we can't scale. And my group at MIT is always going to be relatively small. We can't reach so many teachers around the world directly. One thing we can do is we try to do in this course is you, we have some megaphone where we can share our ideas. But more important, we can connect people together. So I think what we find most important about that online course is not that we are spreading our ideas to these people, but people are meeting each other. People who care about learning about these things are starting to influence and, and, and connect with one another. So that's like one type of thing we're doing. Obviously, putting out a book is another way of trying to do it. Uh, at the end of my book, I describe myself. I say that I'm a short-term pessimist, long-term optimist. And I'm a short-term pessimist because I know how difficult it is to shift mindsets and to shift structures. And I don't, you know, I'm not naive to think that it's going to happen overnight. And I know that it's hard to make these types of changes. Uh, so in the short term, I'm pessimistic about it having this widespread, you know, change to the type of, you know, the type of education that I would want. It's not going to happen overnight. On the other hand, I am a long-term optimist. Partly because I see some good examples. So you can see the glimmerings of schools and museums and libraries that are doing things differently and can help serve as models for the change. I'm a long-term optimist because I see today's kids. I see the kids in the Scratch community. And some of those kids, when they grow up, they're going to have some different ways of thinking. And they'll help bring about the change as they grow up. And we're in this for the long term. You have to be in it for the long game. So I'm willing to wait for those kids to grow up to, you know, to, to, to help push this forward. Also. I'm convinced that the type of ideas I'm talking about today are essential for you know, success and happiness in the future society. So there can be pressures that, that come to bear that will make these things come about. And it won't happen all by itself, but the need for creative thinking, I'm just convinced, will be you know, incredibly important for people to thrive both in the workplace and outside of the workplace, to lead full, you know, full and fulfilling lives. It's not just about an economic imperative, although I think it is, but it's also you know, a human humanistic opportunity to have people lead a joyful, meaningful, fulfilling life. I do think creative thinking is so important. So I do think there'll be all sorts of things that places that do succeed in this way will attract attention, will attract more people, and it will spread eventually, but it's not going to happen you know, right away. But I continue to be the long-term optimist. So. Uh, I, th I think it will happen, but we need everyone to help in it. It's not going to happen by itself. It will happen as long as we all join in to make it happen. One last question down the back there. Thank you. I'd like to also express my thanks. That was a wonderful and really philosophy and way of thinking. Um, the question I have for you is when should we stop using Scratch? And by that I mean um, in the system here in Australia in our curriculum. There's a quite clear divide between primary and secondary education where they talk about visual programming at primary school. And then the secondary years are just completely gone. Apart from interpretation languages, and I just wondered if you had a, an opinion or a viewpoint on that and whether uh, the longer you use Scratch, does that in fact make it more difficult to pick up text based programming and is it maybe too complementary? Yeah. What are your thoughts there? Yeah. So there, there's a few different thoughts I have there. First of all, although it's certainly clear that if someone wants to go on and become you know, a major in computer science at university or become a computer science professional, obviously they need to learn text-based programming at some point. For me, though, it's not obvious to me that all kids should learn text-based programming. For me, what I think to help kids learn the core ideas, computational thinking ideas, computational fluency, I feel that Scratch is what's needed for the wide range of kids. So again, if I was writing a school or developing a national curriculum, I would make that the foundation and have this be the basic platform that you can use in all different ways. As, as, as I noted, we keep adding more modules. You'll be able to do more and more things with Scratch. So I think the take capabilities you know, will be there. Now, for people who want to do more complex programs of a certain sort or go on for, you know, with, with getting jobs you know, where they're using coding. Obviously, they need to move on. But I would make that an elective, that you go on and do that you know, if that's the path you want to go down. 
Uh, but for me, I think the core ideas that I think are important for everyone, if we look at what's important for everyone, I think that's what we want to try to do with Scratch. And I think our goal with Scratch, when I mentioned the metaphor of low floor, high ceiling, wide walls, our deepest commitment is to low floor and wide walls, to get started and have a wide range of ways of using it, but also to have more and more things you can continue to do to push up the ceiling in ways that make sense for the wide range of people. And if there's some, I, for me at least, text-based programming is a more narrow pursuit is the way I would think about it. Um, so that, that's what I would do. But I know that that's not the way everyone sees it. <laughs> I'd like to say thank you to begin with, and I'm sure everyone here would agree with me that we've been very privileged tonight to have Mitch here right in front of us, giving us his inspirational views and um, just entire leadership, thought leadership behind um, learning, creativity, and also um, digital technologies and how to use it in a very appropriate uh, manner. So I'd like to say thank you very much for uh, mm. being here. and. Yeah. Thank you now to uh, join us out in the foyer for some canapes and uh, some drinks, please. Thanks. A little idea can create a big world. I was kind of uh, in the middle of nowhere, I guess, kind of wondering where I wanted to be. We looked for opportunities to engage with outside uh, experiences. Went to a little course one day, learned how to animate a little stick figure, uh, came home and, and showed all of my kids, um, but Max was the one that kind of took to it, and a couple of weeks later I happened to walk by, he'd taken that stick figure to a, a whole other level. I used animation for five minutes and already wanted it to be my job. One of those was the ACS Big Day In. I thought it was great. The first idea that maybe what I did in my recreational time could be something I did in the future where I worked. I was immediately booked. I, I was kind really of want to do that. Uh, in the middle of I nowhere, I guess, kind of wondering where I wanted to be. We looked for opportunities to engage with outside uh, experiences. Went to a little course one day, learned how to animate a little stick figure, uh, came home and, and showed all of my kids. Um, but Max was the one that kind of took to it, and a couple of weeks later I happened to walk by. He'd taken that stick figure to a whole other level. I used animation for five minutes and already wanted it to be my job. One of those was the ACS Big Day In. I thought it was great. The first idea that maybe what I did in my recreational time could be something I did in the future where I worked. I was immediately hooked. He was going to do something amazing. I Working really want to do that. I was blown away by how much he had learned and how much he taught himself. Technology's enabled him to have that vision and that um, passion for what he wants to do. If you have an idea, you can create something. He is obviously passionate about it. He's having fun. He's learning. It was amazing. Uh, I went from having uh, a son who didn't want to get out of bed, who didn't know what he was going to do, to this inspired, uh, happy person who was looking forward to you know, where he was going to be and, and, and just champing at the bit to get out there and prove to himself he that no he was going to do something amazing. To, no Working in technology allows me to do pretty much anything I want to. To use technology, you just have to have a great imagination. Technology is limited. If you've got an idea, follow it. Follow your passion you can because this industry is really ready to embrace you and to open doors for you if you've got courage to walk through them. One day I'm going to run those businesses and I'm going to make it different. As parents, we, we kind of 
help our kids along a learning path. So if our kids are learning to ride a bike, we've kind of got an idea about how we want to guide them to that point of, you know, letting them go. And technology is no different. We need to realise that technology will be what empowers our kids, no matter which job they go into, no matter what kind of skills or academic results our kids get, technology will be the factor that helps them in their own lives. Technology is limitless. If you can think it, you can make it happen. People are suddenly able to do anything that they want to do. People can do uh, amazing things with technology. It makes their lives better.